Hello, I'm Dr. Jeffrey Hayes, Education Specialist of the American Society for Reproductive Medicine. Welcome to this presentation of the ASRM Grand Rounds webinar series. These webinars are designed to address topics in the ABOG Learning Guide in Reproductive Endocrinology and Infertility. Today's presentation is by Dr. Lisa Halverson. Dr. Halverson is Chief of the Gynecological Health and Disease Branch, Eunice Kennedy Schreiber, National Institute of Child Health and Human Development. The title of her talk is Neuroendocrine Regulation of Gonadotrope Function. I will now review the details of today's presentation. After the webinar is done, please do not forget to return to ASRM eLearn to take the post-test and complete the survey for your continuing education credits. You must complete the post-test question successfully and complete the survey to receive credit and be able to print off your certificate. If you wish to ask a question to the speaker about the presentation, when you return to ASRM eLearn, click on the page link labeled questions and an ASRM email address will be provided. The question form will only be open for a period after this presentation is posted. After the time period for questions has expired, the questions page will be a frequently asked questions page pertaining to this presentation and topic. We are very excited for our talk today, so I will now turn things over to our speaker. Hello. Um, so as you've just heard, what I'm going to speak about today is uh, neuroendocrine regulation of gonadotrope function um, with general focus on the pituitary gland. And I refer you back to the excellent presentation by Dr. Sarah Berga on uh, hypothalamic function. I have nothing to disclose. I've listed here the ABOG learning objectives that we will be discussing today. I'm not going to read through these for you, but as you can see, we're touching on quite a few of them. Um, both neuroendocrine function and disease states, as well as uh, focused information on the pituitary gland. The pituitary gland was originally called the master gland in that it was thought to control many physiologic functions. And while it certainly does have important uh, influences uh, throughout many organ systems, um, it is now known to be controlled by multiple inputs from both the hypothalamus and the periphery, as we'll discuss in more detail later. The pituitary gland is now known to consist of two separate tissues of different developmental origin, again, under multiple um, various control mechanisms. So the pituitary gland consists of the anterior pituitary gland, also known as the adenohypophysis, and the posterior pituitary gland called the neural hypothesis. The anterior pituitary gland is regulated by hypothalamic neuronal secretions, which are released at the median eminence and drain into the pituitary portal circulation, while the posterior pituitary gland actually consists of axons from hypothalamic neurons. And we'll go over these nuclei in a little more detail in a moment. So what do we know about pituitary gland development? Shown here in schematic is a four-week embryo um, with two critical areas of note relative to the pituitary gland. The first here is Rathke's pouch. The anterior pituitary gland develops from an invagination of Rathke's pouch, while the posterior pituitary gland develops from an evagination of what will ultimately become the floor of the third ventricle. Shown here in quite a bit more detail, we won't go through this, but you can have these slides as a reference. Um, and as you see here, you've got further and further uh, invagination of the oral ectoderm at Rathke's pouch. This will later become the mouth. And here, evagination from the developing brain and ventricles until you get down to what's shown here, which is the adult pituitary gland, with the yellow showing neural tissue and the pink showing endocrine tissue. There is a small pars or intermediate lobe present in the human, but it's not particularly functional. It's much more important in other mammalian species. You can also imagine, based on the way that this tissue develops, that you can end up with cystic areas within the pituitary. And um, 
one of the um, abnormalities sometimes seen in patients is the presence of a Rathke's pouch cyst, which can impact pituitary function and is a holdover of, the, of um, this developmental process. So what is the relationship between the hypothalamus and the pituitary gland? Here we see um, in sagittal section, the human brain face here, back of the head here, corpus callosum, here the hypothalamic structures with the infundibulum coming down to the pituitary gland. Going here, we see this in the larger, um, larger size. And one of the things that's important to notice is how close the pituitary is to the optic chiasm, thus the fact that, in uh, that any process that enlarges the anterior pituitary can impact visual function. Also note that this stalk here that's critical both for getting blood from the hypothalamus. Note also that this stalk or infundibulum is uh, very narrow and that that can also have important clinical consequences in that if this is transected for any reason, you will lose both neural connections to the posterior pituitary gland as, and secretions from the hypothalamus will not be able to get to the anterior pituitary to control anterior pituitary gland function. So here we see the adenohypothesis or anterior pituitary gland, again, a highly secretory gland with a large blood supply shown here, all of the um, venules and portal circulation, um, the very heterotopic tissue with um, both acidophilic and basophilic cell types. Uh, we'll talk about those various cell types in a moment. And over here, we see the posterior pituitary, a more classic-looking neural tissue. Again, uh, this demonstrates the complex vascular system that bathes the pituitary. So there is direct arterial connection between the posterior, anterior pituitary, and the infundibulum. And this, as well as a complex portal system, um, circulation in the same area. So what this um, allows, again, hypothalamic secretions can reach the pituitary gland, but this also allows for a local feedback system to the hypothalamus, or what's sometimes called a short feedback loop. So as you can see, there are um, many different hypothalamic nuclei, um, each of which is important uh, for various pituitary function. Um, what we'll mostly be focusing on today is the preoptic area of the hypothalamus and the um, arcuate nucleus. Um, both of these contain the majority of the GnRH neuronal cell bodies, which are critical, of course, for gonadotrope function. In terms of the neural hypothesis, the two primary um, nuclei that are uh, important are the paraventricular nuclei, which is circled in blue, and the supraoptic nucleus. We're not going to discuss the posterior pituitary um, at length today, but I just wanted to remind you that it secretes two peptide hormones. One of them is antidiuretic hormone, or ADH. Uh, alternatively called arginine vasopressin. And this is, of course, important for um, regulation of osmolarity um, as well as uh, pressure or baroregulation in the vascular system. So there are receptors in the left atrium, the carotids and the aorta, which feed back into the CNS and provide information that subsequently leads to appropriate secretion of ADH. Oxytocin, of course, has critical roles both in myometrial contraction, uh, particularly at the time of labor and delivery, as well as milk ejection during lactation. Um, posterior pituitary only contains the neuronal endings, not the cell bodies. And I tell you this just to remind you that those cell bodies are up in the hypothalamus where they are impacted um, by uh, axonal connections throughout the CNS. Now we'll move to the anterior pituitary. And as you all know, 
Um, there are five hormone secreting cell types uh, in the anterior pituitary, which secrete six primary hormones. The gonadotropes, which secrete LH and FSH, somatotropes responsible for biosynthesis and secretion of growth hormone, lactotropes, which secrete prolactin, corticotropes, which secrete um, adrenocorticotropic hormone, and thyrotropes responsible for secretion of thyroid stimulating hormone. There are, of course, many other cell types within the anterior pituitary gland, um, including uh, all, all the vascular structures that we saw earlier. Um, Particularly important are the so-called support cells or folliculostellate cells. Um, and over the last couple of decades, we've realized that these folliculostellate cells or FS cells actually secrete a number of factors which are important for local regulation of um, secretion by these various cell types. So there is a very robust uh, local paracrine um, system acting in this gland that we won't have a chance to go through in detail, but we'll talk about again in a few minutes. So let's talk about the pituitary glycoprotein family. Um, this family consists of four molecules, LH, FSH, TSH, and HCG, all of which are heterodimers consisting of a common alpha subunit linked to a beta subunit, which provides functional specificity. There are unique receptors for LH beta, FSH beta, and TSH beta, and CG beta um, binds to the so-called LHCG receptor. These unique receptors that provide the functional specificity for these hormones. Although because of their close structural similarities, overexpression can lead to cross-reaction. And the classic example, which would be high levels of Beta HCG produced by a molar pregnancy, which can then bind to the TSH receptor and lead to hypothyroidism. Also important um, to the function of these hormones is um, various glycosylation, which can change depending on the time of the menstrual cycle, um, and also is altered at the time of menopause. Um, but the details about the um, glycosylation patterns are still being worked out. This is a very idealized a schematic of the location of the various pituitary hormones. Again, here you see the neural hypothesis in yellow, and here we have the anterior pituitary gland the growth hormone cells vary. About 40% of the anterior pituitary gland um, cell types are uh, actually growth hormone secreting cells, which you can see by the large circular areas here. ACTH cells tend to be in the middle, TSH cells anteriorly, and prolactin cells in the back. Of course, you notice that gonadotrope cells are not shown here congregated and tend to be dispersed throughout the medial portion of the gland. And this can have uh, some clinical implications if there's a mass or infarct in this area. To remind you, so this is just to show you the five hypothalamic pituitary uh, target axes. GnRH secreted by the arcuate nucleus primarily travels through the median eminence where it's secreted into the pituitary portal circulation, binds to receptors on the gonadotrope, which in response secrete LH and FSH, which travels through the periphery to bind to receptors on the ovaries and testes, which in response to LH and FSH um, produce both hormones as well as gametes. The prolactin system is um, a little unique in that it's primarily inhibited by hypothalamic factors, while the others are primarily stimulated by the hypothalamic factors. So in this case, dopamine has a substantial inhibitory effect on the secretion of prolactin. Of course, prolactin is important for uh, lactation within the breast. Um, growth hormone releasing hormone stimulates growth hormone, which has effects throughout the periphery. Thyrotropin releasing factor from the hypothalamus stimulates thyroid 
um, TSH secretion, which then acts on the thyroid, and corticotropin releasing hormone stimulates ECTH production by the somatotropes, which of course goes to the adrenal gland. This is a very schematized picture of the hypothalamic pituitary axis, again showing hypothalamic release of GnRH acting at the pituitary, leading to secretion of LH and FSH which acts on the ovaries to stimulate both follicular maturation as well as hormonal production. Um, the best known of these are the steroids, estrogen, and progesterone, which of course have effects um, at the uterus as well as throughout the body. Estrogen and progesterone feedback at both the level of the pituitary and the hypothalamus. Uh, primarily, this is an inhibitory effect, except at the time of the mid-cycle surge. Um, also, the ovaries produce a peptide called inhibin, and as its name suggests, inhibin is inhibitory for um, gonadotrope function with um, specific effects on the FSH gonadotropes. A little bit of information about GnRH. Majority of neurons in the hypothalamus originate from the cerebral ventricle. And GnRH neurons are a little bit different because they actually originate from the olfactory placode. And this uh, different um, embryologic origin does have clinical significance. GnRH is a small peptide, in this case a decapeptide consisting of 10 amino acids shown here released as pulses and has a very short half-life. Um, and because of this short half-life, it cannot be measured in the periphery. And as you know, clinically, we do not measure hypothalamic hormones. We measure the, the peripheral hormones because of this short half-life. I've shown here that the one position and 10 position tend to be a location of changes in amino acid composition to create antagonists, while this sixth position is critical for creation of agonists. So G as we just said, the GnRH neurons have a sort of unique birthplace in that they start in the olfactory placode, shown here, along with the olfactory neurons. They travel up. They need to cross the cribriform plate where some may travel up towards the olfactory bulb, but the majority will curve around here down into the basal form brain and ultimately reach the media basal hypothalamus, where they will then send projections down to the median eminence to impact gonadotrope function. Abnormalities in this migration are important for the development of Kalman syndrome, as we'll come back to. Like many hypothalamic hormones, GnRH is secreted as pulses. These pulses are critical for appropriate biosynthesis and secretion of LH and FSH. This was actually first described by Ernst Nobile in his Nobel Prize winning work. For these experiments, he actually used the primate system in which he transected the infundibulum so that he was in control of the GnRH that reached the pituitary. And what he showed was in response to pulsatile GnRH, the animal's pituitaries secreted large amounts of LH shown in blue and FSH shown in green. However, when he switched to continuous stimulation, levels of LH and FSH dropped markedly. And then he showed that, in fact, the cells were still viable because when he went back to pulsatile GnRH secretion, they happily secreted LH and FSH again. Of course, this also is clinically very useful as we use this uh, in treating patients with GnRH agonists in which the patients essentially see continuous GnRH, which somewhat paradoxically shuts down LH and FSH secretion and therefore um, ovarian function. So basic concepts about anterior pituitary function. The pituitary hormones act in classical endocrine fashion on target organs in the periphery. Direct measurement of pituitary hormones is clinically useful. Again, this is in contrast to measurement of hypothalamic hormones, which have such short half-lives and are secreted in such small amounts. Pituitary hormones tend to have some diurnal variations and their pulsatile secretion can make timing of blood draws critical. 
um, depending on which pituitary hormone we're talking about. Obviously, uh, time of testing during the menstrual cycle is critical. Um, it's looking at LH and FSH levels. As another point, growth hormone measurement is not particularly helpful because of high amplitude pulses, and we use IGF-1 instead. Again, we'll come back to that in a little bit. So gonadotropes are about 15 to 20 percent of hormone secreting cells. Most secrete both LH and FSH from separate secretion granules. However, there are some LH only and FSH only gonadotropes, um, and the relative ratio of these may vary across the menstrual cycle. Biosynthesis and secretion of the gonadotropins is regulated by input from hypothalamic factors, primarily GnRH, feedback from ovarian steroids, obviously estrogen, progesterone, and perhaps uh, even in uh, women androgens, um, ovarian peptides, particularly in HIBIN, um, intrapituitary derived factors, as well as adipose derived factors. And this list is, is uh, increasing um, all the time. And again, LH and FSH have specific cell surface receptors on the ovary. Now, as you know, LH and FSH secretion, I should say LH and FSH are not always secreted at the same uh, rate across the menstrual cycle or at different times in the lifespan. How is this achieved? Well, there are probably multiple mechanisms for this, and three are listed here. One is that LH and FSH have a differential response to GnRH pulse frequency. Second, there's some differential feedback by the ovarian steroids. Um, and third, there's preferential control of FSH synthesis by the active inhibin follistatin system. What's shown here uh, is the difference in GnRH pulse frequency across uh, the menstrual cycle. On the left, we see the relative fast frequency, low amplitude uh, GnRH pulses, characteristic of the follicular phase. These are generally about every 30 minutes. On the right, we see the um, slower pulse frequency, higher amplitude um, pulses, um, characteristic of the luteal phase. These are generally about every two to four hours. Fast pulse frequency preferentially stimulates LH biosynthesis secretion. Conversely, slow pulse frequency stimulates FSH secretion. So what we're seeing here is that the fast pulse frequency during the follicular phase is preferentially increasing LH levels, while the slow pulse frequency over time towards the end of the luteal phase is preferentially stimulating FSH secretion. Second way in which LH and FSH are differentially regulated is through the inhibin active and folostatin system. Inhibins and activins are structurally closely related. Um, inhibins consist of an alpha and beta heterodimer, while activins are a a uh, homodimer of the beta subunit. As their name suggests, inhibins inhibit and activins activate gonadotrope function. Inhibins are classic endocrine chemicals in that they're produced in the ovaries or the testes, secreted into the peripheral circulation and act on a tissue, in this case the pituitary, to inhibit function. Conversely, activins are produced throughout the body and have local effects. So they're really autocrine, paracrine actors, and they are produced, as shown here, in the pituitary. The pituitary also produces a hormone called folostatin, produced primarily by the folliculocellate support cells that we mentioned earlier. And folostatin binds to and blocks activin action. So what we have is a very complex intrapituitary system in which GnRH is not only acting directly on the gonadotropes to stimulate gonadotropin production, but is also stimulating activin and folostatin production, which are creating a tight um, regulatory system. And the pituitary is responding to feedback from the ovary. Again, this 
three proteins shown here primarily impacting FSH, not LH. So this is the classic menstrual cycle that you can all draw out for yourself. Again, just showing you relative differences in LH and FSH across time, early in the menstrual cycle, relatively high FSH levels that then drop under both gonadal steroid feedback and feedback by inhibins produced in the ovary. Mid-cycle, small increase in progesterone is thought to lead to a small FSH surge. Um, and the much larger increase in estrogen triggers an LH surge. So what we see across the follicular cycle is a progressive decline in FSH in response to the, fault, to the fast GnRH pulse frequency, um, as well as increasing levels of inhibin from the ovary. Relative small increase in LH until we get to the mid-cycle, at which point the negative steroidal feedback changes to a positive feedback. This has been poorly understood, but emerging data suggests that it's achieved um, through the so-called candy neuron system in the hypothalamus, KNDY, standing for kispeptin, neurokinin B, and dynorphin. Again, something we don't have time to go through now, but um, worth keeping an eye out as we um, understand the role of these hypothalamic neurons, both for creation of the mid-cycle surge as well as initiation of puberty. After ovulation, inhibitor levels stay high, initially suppressing FSH levels, which then begin to come up as inhibitor levels and steroid levels drop. Inhibitor switches from inhibitor type A to inhibitor B. Um, but again, it's very high in the luteal phase, keeping FSH levels low until the end of the luteal phase, at which point this increase in FSH will recruit the follicles for the next menstrual cycle to begin. So what about gonadotropins across the lifespan? We talked about um, development of the hypothalamic pituitary axis during embryology. In fact, there's a functional connection between these two by the end of the first trimester, at which point you begin to see an increase in LH and FSH levels, which is then suppressed in response to the high levels of placental steroids produced uh, during pregnancy. Then at birth, with removal of the placenta, there's a sudden peak in LH and FSH levels that is then repressed throughout childhood. This suppression, again, may be achieved through these candy neuron systems, but um, it, it is under a lot of investigation at the moment. With the onset of puberty, the low LH secretion then becomes pulsatile initially during the night, the so-called nocturnal LH pulsatility. Overall, LH and FSH levels increase during puberty, stimulating gonadal um, steroid production and all of the changes observed during puberty. And of course, there is a pulsatile, or uh, not truly pulsatile, but this is just attempting to show various menstrual cycles throughout the reproductive years. And then with menopause, increase in both LH and FSH levels um, with loss of gonadal steroid um, function. The other thing to notice is that in the prepubertal stage, FSH levels are relatively high compared to, compared to LH levels. Same is true during the menopause, and this is the converse during the reproductive years. And this ratio can be helpful, um, particularly when trying to distinguish whether a patient is in delayed or actually arrested puberty, again, by just looking at this FSH-LH ratio. So there are multiple causes um, of chronic anovulation that can be attributed to abnormalities in the hypothalamic pituitary axis. Obviously, this differs from ovarian causes of chronic anovulation, which are a different topic. I've broken them down as shown here. Um, the first are the so-called functional 
causes, often from hypothalamic amenorrhea. Um, this consists of eating disorders, stress, excessive exercise, and these were all discussed at length by Dr. Berger in her presentation, so we won't discuss them here. The other two causes that I do want to discuss are inherited abnormalities as well as hypothalamic pituitary lesions. So what about inherited abnormalities? They have classically been broken up into idiopathic hypogonadotropic hypogonadism, or IHH, and Kalman syndrome, which is IHH with anosmia, or inability to smell. As we'll show in a moment, these distinctions um, are relatively arbitrary and are being broken down as we learn more about what causes these, these two um, categories of disorders. So both IHH and Kalman's are characterized by GnRH deficiency resulting in low L F LH and FSH from the pituitary and therefore low estradiol production. The clinical presentation of IHH will vary on the time of onset as well as the severity of the deficit. So patients may have delayed or arrested puberty. They may have some pubertal development but never develop amenorrhea, so have primary amenorrhea. They may have secondary amenorrhea, or they may have relatively normal puberty and menstrual function, um, but be infertile due to mild um, ovulatory dysfunction. Management of IHH depends on what's trying to be achieved. Um, pulsatile GnRH um, will generally be effective, but is uh, clinically uh, not often available and much more difficult to provide because you need to give a pump, um, so generally not used. Um, gonadotropins are certainly first uh, line in the treatment of infertility. Um, if the patient is not trying to be pregnant, to get pregnant, then you just um, may give them estrogen progesterone therapy for bone protection. For those patients who have not gone through puberty, they may be given um, estrogen to complete puberty, and then of course need progesterone for endometrial protection. Uh, likewise, patients who have gone through puberty um, may just be given um, hormonal add back therapy. So let's talk about Kalman syndrome. Kalman syndrome is GnRH deficiency associated with the inability to smell. As we discussed earlier, fetal GnRH secreted neurons um, migrate from the olfactory placode into the medial basal hypothalamus. Failure of this migration, so here we see olfactory epithelium with olfactory and GnRH secreting neurons that are supposed to make it through the cribriform plate to the olfactory tract and to the medial basal hypothalamus. Failure of this migration shown here on the right results in Kalman syndrome. Patients with Kalman syndrome were found to, um, the development of Kalman syndrome was identified to be a X-linked, autosomal recessive, or autosomal dominant, but most like, most commonly X-linked, and therefore, not surprisingly, a gene was identified on the X chromosome called the Col1 gene that was responsible for a subset of these patients. So the Col1 gene encodes a, program, uh, a protein called anosmin, which is critical for directing neuronal migration along the correct path. And the phenotype can vary depending on the degree of abnormality. There may be delayed puberty um, or irregular menses. Again, these patients have anosmia. They have a unicoid habitus because they've had relatively low levels of estrogen stimulating bone growth, which allows preferential growth of the long bones before fusion. Um, many of these patients also have unilateral renal agenesis. Um, was suggesting anosmin is also important for renal development. Over the last, say, 10 to 15 years, many more genes have been identified that are critical for migration of GnRH neurons in addition to the Col1 gene. So um, we won't go into these in detail, but many of these genes are not X-linked, which is 
explains why there are autosomal dominant and recessive forms of this disorder. We've also discovered that there are mutations um, in genes important for gene or rate secretion, including adipose-related leptin. Um, again, these kispeptin genes, um, et cetera, that are all important for um, GnRH neuronal function. And obviously, if, that, if GnRH function is abnormal, you're not going to get normal pituitary function, as well as other mutations in the GnRH receptor. So the take-home message here is that historically, We've talked about IHH with or without anosmia, with anosmia called Kalman syndrome. But the term idiopathic hypothalamic hypogonadism um, is less and less accurate as we do, in fact, identify the genes that are causative. Um, plus, we're finding that for many of these gene defects that there are varying degrees of anosmia, so the strict distinction between IHH and Kalman's is probably also no longer relevant, but it's still useful terminology that you'll see in the literature. So we'll move on from inherited disorders to talk about hypothalamic pituitary lesions. I'm not going to go through this whole list, but they can be broken down into various types of tumors infiltrative inflammatory diseases, vascular abnormalities, as well as iatrogenic causes, trauma, radiation, and surgery. Most of these lesions are destructive and therefore cause loss of GnRH, but I should also mention, of course, the hematoma, um, which is a GnRH-secreting congenital malformation that actually, because it secretes GnRH, may lead to um, overactivation of the pituitary and precocious puberty. Pituitary lesions can also be broken down in a, in a similar way. We're going to talk uh, quite a bit about the various types of hormone secreting adenomas. There are also, again, inflammatory conditions, other space occupying lesions, empty cell syndrome is observed when you get fluid from the third ventricle entering the cella that the pituitary sits in, which can cause compression of the various pituitary cell types and dysfunction. And you can see a Rathke cyst or aneurysms that can cause pressure on the, on, in the small cell that the pituitary sits in. As we all know, the pituitary increases in size up to 50% uh, during pregnancy. Um, the majority of this increase in size is due to um, both an increase in the size and the number of the lactotropes, the prolactin-secreting cells. If there is a large blood loss uh, at the time of delivery, the decrease in vascular um, blood supply and vascular pressure can lead to infarction of the pituitary gland known as Sheehan syndrome. I refer you to uh, Dr. Berger's um, presentation, which discussed this at length. I will just uh, point out that we primarily talk about Sheehan's as being panhypopituitarism in which all cell types are impacted, but in fact, um, you can have um, a wide range um, of, of damage to the pituitary such that only certain cell types are impacted. You can also observe stock transection due to surgery or radiation in the area. Classic presentation is the rapid deceleration um, that occurs uh, with a car accident in which sudden tension on the stalk will actually transect it. And this would now pre prevent hormones from getting from the hypothalamus to the pituitary via the portal system, and it will also transect potentially the exonal cell bodies uh, transmitting uh, posterior pituitary hormones. Pituitary masses can have multiple effects. One of particular relevance to this discussion is the influence on anovulation and amenorrhea can occur through three different mechanisms, um, perhaps more. Amenorrhea can develop due to local compression and damage to the gonadotrope, to stalk compression, which can prevent inhibition of prolactin secretion, and therefore development of secondary hyperprolactinemia, or amenorrhea may occur due to direct prolactin secretion by the um, a prolactinoma itself. These masses, because of their location, shown here, 
may also cause headaches if they're very large, visual loss because of pressure on the optic chiasm, um, and even seizures. Classic visual loss described is so-called bitemporal hemianopsia, which is loss of vision um, peripherally uh, be because of the crossover of the um, visual nerves at the point of the optic chiasm. Pituitary cell adenomas may be derived from any of the five anterior pituitary cell types, um, although lactotrope derived prolactinomas are the most common, and we're going to go uh, through all of these uh, briefly. So gonadotrophic adenomas tend to secrete monomeric subunits. In other words, they secrete alpha subunit, LH beta subunit, or less commonly the FSH beta subunit, and very rarely um, secrete um, functional dimeric gonadotropins. However, rarely this will be observed and in those cases, patients, um, if young, may undergo precocious puberty, or if um, post-pubertal, may um, develop ovarian hyperstimulation due to the high levels of gonadotropins. And these have, in fact, uh, been reported. So generally, a gonadotrope-derived adenoma is suspected because a bath is found in the pituitary, but by peripheral blood testing, no other type of pituitary um, adenoma uh, is observed, in which case you can go back now um, and ask them to measure um, the monomeric gonadotropin subunits for confirmation. These gonadotrope adenomas have um, been called silent or non-functioning adenomas because the monomeric subunits are unable to bind to the receptors and stimulate gonadal function. However, uh, up to 30% of these adenomas do not um, appear to be producing or secreting any proteins at all and are therefore just presumed to be derived from gonadotrope cells. And treatment for these is surgical with or without uh, x-ray therapy. So what about excess prolactin production? So as we said earlier, prolactin is unique amongst anterior pituitary hormones because it's primarily under negative regulation um, by dopamine. Clinically relevant is the fact that lactotropes are stimulated by thyroid, um, by thyrotropin releasing hormone. And we'll go uh, talk about that again in a moment. Um, but again, primary effect is negative by dopamine and therefore stock transaction, for example, which prevents dopamine re reaching the lactotropes will result in hyperprolactinemia and the clinical sequelae of that. So hyperprolactinemia clinically has been termed the amenorrhea, galactorrhea syndrome. 9% of patients with oligomenorrhea have been found to have hyperprolactinemia in one study, or up to 9% of patients with oligomenorrhea have been found to have hyperprolactinemia. One way to think about the differential diagnosis is to remember the five Ps, pregnancy and other physiologic causes, pharmacology, prolactinoma, or other pituitary masses um, that may, again, prevent dopamine inhibition of prolactin secretion, primary hypothyroidism via TRH, and polycystic ovary syndrome. And the reason for the mild Elevation prolactin seen in some patients with PCOS is uh, not well understood at this point. So what are some of the physiologic causes? Of course, pregnancy and breastfeeding are associated with an increase in prolactin. Prolactin is slightly higher during the luteal phase, and therefore some clinicians will um, prefer to measure prolactin during follicular phase. Stress, exercise, eating, and sleeping can all increase uh, prolactin levels, at least to some degree. Therefore, it may be best to avoid drawing prolactin, say, immediately after lunch or immediately upon a patient waking up um, if they happen to be in, the, in their clinic early. Any type of breast stimulation will also increase prolactin, whether it be sexual activity, surgery, such as heart surgery, um, inflammation due to herpes zoster, um, 
Again, this leads to the question of whether you should measure a prolactin after doing a breast exam in the office. And so some um, physicians will bring the patient back the next day. I tend to just go ahead and measure the prolactin. If it's normal, there's probably no problem. But if it's elevated, bring them back for a repeat. I'm not going to read this list of hormones to you. Um, just point out that birth control pills, particularly the estrogen, can increase prolactin levels, generally not clinically significant. Um, and most clinicians now will give um, OCPs to patients, even with small adenomas, um, if this is the best form of, of contraception for them. Other uh, medications are listed here, and others are being added all the time. In general, while a new medication can be tried, the, the patient's requirement for the medication um, may outweigh concerns about a, a very minimal increase in prolactin level. How does hyperprolactinemia lead to anovulation? There are many theories out there. Here's one that I think is relatively generally accepted, um, but probably does not explain um, all cases. There are many different proposed ways in which prolactin may impact ovulatory function. For example, in uh, rodent species, prolactin is actually leads to luteolysis, so there's a direct ovulatory function. There are prolactin receptors in the human ovary, although their, their relevance is, is not um, well understood. So I think most people talk about the mechanism shown here in which an elevation in prolactin leads to a reflex increase in hypothalamic dopamine. There are dopamine receptors on GnRH neurons and other CNS neurons that impact uh, GnRH neural function. So a change in GnRH pulsatility leads to a change in LHFSH secretion, which secondarily leads to a change um, to ovulatory dysfunction. How do you evaluate for elevated prolactin? Obviously, you take a history, including uh, medication history, do a physical exam, including visual field, thyroid exam, again, looking for primary hypothyroidism, which could have a reflex increase in TRH, and therefore increase uh, prolactin levels. Uh, look for breast discharge. You can always take a little bit of breast discharge, put it on a slide, and look for fat globules under the microscope. Laboratory evaluation, again, Generally, morning serum prolactin, um, not too close to a meal, preferably during the follicular phase. Um, I always, uh, in my initial evaluation, will also do thyroid function tests, looking for hypothyroidism, and of course, you need to rule out pregnancy. Shown over here are five different forms of prolactin, major form here little prolactin, big prolactin, glycosylated forms, et cetera. Um, this is important to under, it's important to understand that there are multiple different prolactin forms because there may be differences between biologically observed evidence of hyperprolactinemia and what is measured in the assays. So a patient may have high levels of prolactin on um, serum measurement, but not have clinically significant hyperprolactinemia. There is a lot of controversy in the literature about when to uh, perform an MRI looking for an adenoma. I tend to have a very low threshold um, for performing an MRI because there can be a, a big discrepancy between the prolactin level and the size of the adenoma. For example, if you had a large gonadotrope adenoma that was impacting dopamine from getting to the lactotropes, you may only see a small elevation in prolactin, but in fact have a large mass that deserves significant attention. So again, I have a low threshold to do that MRI. By definition, less than one centimeter microadenoma over one centimeter macroadenoma. Primary treatment for prolactinomas is medical, unless there is an acute event, such as acute vision loss um, or evidence for acute bleeding into the mass. Shown here on the right are a before and after medical treatment. 
MRI of a, the same patient showing that you can have remarkable regression simply with medical treatment. Historically, lumocrystine um, binds to both dopamine type 1 and type 2 receptors. Um, it needed to be given multiple times a day and um, had significant side effects. Nausea, headache, best started at low dose, um, particularly um, generally at night before the patient went to bed to try to decrease the effects, the side effects. We now have uh, cabergoline, which is B2 selective, can be given uh, generally 0.25 milligrams twice a week, has um, many fewer side effects, um, but can be, expect, uh, can be expensive. Patient does not respond to medication, undergo transcanoidal surgery and resection of the mass. Um, if the mass can't totally be resected or occurs, um, we now have more focused radiation treatment, so-called gamma knife. Um, what about observation? Um, over the last 20 years, we've learned that small microadenomas um, tend not to grow, um, at least not particularly quickly and that observation might just be reasonable in this patient population, particularly those that are having uh, at least somewhat regular um, periods showing that they are making adequate estrogen to protect their bones. Problems with transpenoidal surgery are a relatively high complication rate. Um, as much as uh, 10 to 30 percent of patients will end up with some degree of hypopituitarism. They also experience a CSF leak, as demonstrated by uh, rhinorrhea or fluids from the nose, and a small number will have transient diabetes insipidus. And um, depending on the size and type of the tumor, mortality rates have been quoted as much as 0.5 percent, with recurrence rates of 20 percent. So obviously, again, medical therapy is preferable. For those patients that do have a good response to medical treatment, general recommendations are to repeat the MRI in a year. Long-term recommendations really uh, don't exist. Most people will space out the MRIs uh, depending on the initial size of the, of the tumor and the response. Um, what about a patient who has a prolactinoma and becomes pregnant? So as estrogen does have a stimulatory effect on prolactin secretion, uh, thus the effect of birth control pills to increase prolactin levels a little bit. Prolactin levels actually go up as much as 20-fold during pregnancy, and obviously this is in preparation for lactation. With a 70, what I said before was 50%, but a 50 to 70% increase in pituitary size due to increase in lactotrope uh, size and number. The risk of enlargement is much higher for macroplactinomas than it is for microplactinomas, but even for the macros, this increase is generally not clinically significant. However, patient with macros should be monitored close, closely um, with monthly visual field testing, perhaps an increase uh, repeat MRI. But um, we have to remember that serum prolactins, of course, are not useful because prolactin levels are going up just due to the pregnancy. Um, recommendations are um, always being revisited. Current recommendations are that it is um, probably safe for patients to be on bromocryptine or cabergoline, say during, as they attempt to get pregnant, but that these medications should be stopped as soon as the positive pregnancy test is obtained. Next, we'll talk about the thyroid hormone axis. Again, TSH primarily regulated positively by TRH released from the hypothalamus, but also negatively regulated um, by dopamine with negative feedback from thyroid hormones. So thyrotrope-derived adenomas are relatively rare, and like gonadotrope-derived adenomas rarely produce functional dimeric hormone. Therefore, thyrotrope-derived adenomas most commonly result in TSH deficiency um, and hypopituitarism due to local destruction. It may also impact um, gonadotrope function leading to uh, amenorrhea. I'll talk briefly about 
thyroid levels and uh, amenorrhea. Patients who have primary thyroidism experience oligomenorrhea about 25% of the time. And in fact, young patients before puberty may have a delay in sexual maturation and menarche if they develop hypothyroidism. The mechanism for this link between high thyroid levels and amenorrhea is not well understood, but may be due to T4 um, stimulating production of sex hormone binding globulin, which in turn binds up circulating estrogen levels, um, decreases endometrial development, decreases appropriate feedback by estrogen at the hypothalamus and pituitary. Um, but there are undoubtedly other mechanisms. Conversely, what do we see in patients with primary hypothyroidism? They classically present with menorrhagia. Again, cause is unclear. Um, one mechanism may be that the low thyroid hormone level leads to a reflex increase in TRH secretion by the hypothalamus. And as we've talked about, there are TRH receptors on the lactotropes, which may respond by increasing prolactin and therefore triggering um, the pathway that we saw before um, with the link between prolactin levels and amenorrhea. Other thing to note is patients with severe primary hypothyroidism may appear to have a tumor on MRI because of the secondary hypertrophy that will develop. So again, this is one of the reasons why whenever I am screening a patient for elevated prolactin levels, I also screen for thyroid disease. I have, I have picked up a few cases of hypothyroidism in patients who presented to me for um, failed bromocryptine treatment for elevated prolactin levels. Next, we'll move on to the growth hormone axis. What I want to point out here is that growth hormone is secreted by the pituitary gland, binds to cells throughout the body, um, including uh, in the liver. Liver produces high levels of insulin-like growth factor 1. Um, as well as IGF-2. Um, peripheral cells also produce IGF-1. Most growth hormone effects are actually mediated by IGF levels, and because these levels are relatively stable, screening for growth hormone excess or deficiency is generally done through measurement of IGF-1 levels. So growth hormone has effects on growth, of course, and carbohydrate metabolism. Again, random GH measurements not helpful due to pulsatility. Majority of effects are mediated via IGF-1 produced by the liver, and measurement of IGF-1 correlates well with mean growth hormone levels, so it's a good surrogate for growth hormone levels. Um, and as we said, number of IGFs and IGF-2 may be particularly important uh, for growth during puberty. So the effects of excess growth hormone depend on when this occurs. If it occurs um, before puberty, then patients experience gigantism. If it occurs after puberty, then they experience acromegaly. So what are the signs and symptoms of acromegaly? Marked soft tissue growth is seen in the majority. They also have um, arthralgias, excess sweating, uh, weakness, malocclusion of the jaw, skin tags. 50% of patients with acromegaly will have hypertension and other cardiovascular diseases. And um, in fact, it's cardiovascular disease, which is the most common uh, cause of death in these patients if they're untreated. Oligomenorrhea occurs in many as 50% of the patients, but the mechanism uh, is unknown. I'm going to show some pictures. Here we see gigantism. So these are patients who are exposed to excess levels of growth hormone prior and during puberty. Robert Wadlow is uh, the tallest man reported at 8 feet 11 inches. So we see a patient with acromegaly, classically frontal bossing with increase in the bone and the and thickening of the overlying soft tissue, thickening of the nose, Macrognathia, or extension of the jaw with associated spacing of the teeth. And here, normal hand, acromegalic hand again. Some increase in the bony structure and a lot of increase in soft tissue. 
primary treatment is somatostatin analogs. We said somatostatin is the primary inhibitor um, of growth hormone secretion. Um, octreotide now is available in a long-acting formulation um, and is effective in 50 to 75 percent of patients. However, that still leaves quite a few patients um, who require alternative treatments. They've now developed a growth hormone receptor antagonist. Um, and some patients have been found to respond to a dopamine uh, agonist um, and probably speaks to the fact that there is uh, close embryologic uh, relationships between lactotropes and somatotropes, and so somatotropes do, at least a subset, express uh, dopamine receptors. These tumors tend to be very small and can be very hard to identify at surgery, but if necessary, the patients can undergo surgery or radiation. To finish up the last of the um, HP axes, we have the corticotropin releasing hormone, um, ACTH system. Just to remind you, ACTH um, is actually a cleavage product of pro-opio-melanocorticotropin, or POMC. In addition to ACTH, POMC is broken down into melanocyte stimulating hormone and lipotropin. This becomes important because patients with primary hypo hypoadrenalism or Addison's disease um, will have an increase in POMC production. And in addition um, to the other symptoms, may have darkening of their skin due to the excess of MSH production. So Cushing syndrome is general cortisol excess, whether the Cushing's disease refers specifically to hypercortisolism due to a pituitary source. In other words, a pituitary adenoma producing ACTH. Cortisol excess could be exogenous. We give patients steroids for lots of reasons. Uh, and endogenous, it can be, again, ACTH-dependent, generally pituitary adenoma, or so-called ACTH-independent if the adrenal is pumping out too much steroid. What do we see in patients who have a cortisol excess? Classically, obesity, rash, high blood pressure, glucose intolerance, and up to 75% of women will have a menstrual dysfunction. Also very common is hirsutism, stria, shown here, frontal obesity with peripheral weakness, thinning of the bones, easy bruisability, and depression. Although rare, Cushing's can present quite a bit like PCOS, uh, in that these patients have an ovulation and hirsutism, um, as well as obesity and an ultrasound because of the oligoovulation may have multicystic ovaries. Treatment, first we need to screen for elevated cortisol. Cortisol peaks about 8 o'clock in the morning but there's wide fluctuations, so a single 8 a.m. cortisol is really not adequate to rule out Cushing. Um, classic is to do a 24-hour urine-free cortisol, but others will do a late-night salivary cortisol or an overnight uh, dex suppression test. Then you need to distinguish where it's coming from. In other words, is it pituitary or um, adrenal? Um, is it the pituitary stimulating adrenal production of cortisol or is there a primary adrenal abnormality? Again, there are a number of ways that this can be done. And treatment, if a pituitary adenoma is identified, there are no great medications. So the first line will be to remove the tumor. Again, these tumors can be very small and difficult to locate. Patients can have uh, inferior petrosal sinus sampling. Uh, to look for uh, discrepancies in ACTH release by the right and left sides of the pituitary in the hopes to lateralize the location of the tumor. If surgery isn't successful, then the second line treatment is various medications to either inhibit cortisol synthesis or block glucocorticoid effects, while most recently a somatostatin analog has been shown to have some success. And radiation is also an option. I just want to mention multiple endocrine neoplasia syndromes, or MEN1, CPC, 
very rare, but gaining um, in appreciation. And as we learn they're out there, we're probably going to look for them more often and find them a bit more often. Basically, the MEN syndromes are various combinations of endocrine and non-endocrine tumors. MEN1 is classically the so-called P triad, parathyroid, pituitary, and pancreatic islet tumors due to mutation in the MEN gene. So while tumors are classically in these three tissues, um, as this is being studied more and more, we see that there's abnormal proliferation throughout the body. So it's a complex disorder. Um, and as you can guess by the name, they're also MEN2 and ultimately likely to be MEN3 um, syndromes identified. So after all of that, what are the take-home messages? First, the hypothalamus synthesizes input from the environment, from a wide array of CNS centers, from the pituitary, and from peripheral organ systems. The pituitary gland consists of an endocrine, anterior pituitary gland, and a neuroendocrine posterior pituitary gland. The anterior pituitary gland has five hormone secreting cell types that receives feedback from, receives input from uh, hypothalamic factors, intrapituitary factors, and target organ hormones. And aberrations in any of these pituitary cell types uh, can result in abnormal menses and ovulation and infertility. Although the mechanisms by which this occurs um, is not completely understood and definitely deserves more study. There's some references, and I'll end there.